Well, today we celebrate the another feast of the martyrs, Saints Andrew Ken Taiwan, a priest, and Paul Chanhasang and his companions, martyrs, and I'm sure I'm doing the pronunciation wrong, and so I, I do apologize for that, that I, I should have been able to take the time to have a better sense of that. And, uh, you know, so uh, but that's how it is this morning uh, with all the things that have been happening. So uh, we hear about just some different things in our readings today. Uh, the, this is toward, uh, toward the, you know, going through this letter of St. Paul to Timothy in our reading from, from this, in our reading from Timothy. And, uh, you know, here uh, Paul is just kind of speaking about different things. He's mentioning this, uh, these words that sound like they're taken from an ancient Christian hymn of one kind or the other, uh, where he kind of uh, quotes from it at the end. He it touches on some key moments in, in Christ's life, right? His manifestation as, as man is a sort of incarnation, his resurrection, which is his vindication, right? He's, he's proven against his enemies by being uh, resurrected, by it being a public event. Uh, he is adored in heaven, right? The being seen by the angels, he is preached, he is believed in the world, and then there's the, uh, the ascension. And all of these things are part of the mystery of, of Christ. And it just, to me, it just takes us back to, to understanding that, that this is the, the Easter mystery as a whole. You know, uh, we, the early church would, would refer to like this Paschal mystery. And uh, in the church today, we have a tendency of, of thinking, you know, the the, the death of Christ on the cross that, that saves us, and, and, and certainly that's an integral part of it. But the entire mystery, the entire Easter mystery, is, is all interconnected. Even the ascension is connected to resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit, right? The, the Spirit of the Father and the Son uh, is connected with, with the, the death on the cross. All these things are related. And so there is, is a lot of wisdom in our church uh, featuring prominently, you know, the, the image of Christ crucified. And, uh, but, but there's other images too that are important in the church and just to see it as one continuous whole. And so when we go through Easter and through that, through the um, through Holy Week, through all those, those times to try to, to think about how everything connects and what its purpose is, is, is really important, right? And so, um, so I encourage us to always be intentional in how we, we reflect on these things. And again, it's all one Easter mystery, ultimately, uh, that, that saves us and uh, makes us holy. And so let me go on to the, the gospel. Uh, and and I, I remember hearing this reading uh, growing up. I went to a lot of daily masses growing up and you know, I, I really was kind of confused as to what this was about, you know, this, this, what Jesus is talking about here. But Jesus is talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. And so John is kind of a, an in-between figure. He's kind of one of the Old Testament prophets in some ways, but he's also around the, at the time of Christ, and he points to Christ. And what Jesus is mentioning with the, the children here is he's, he's comparing the people around him to children who complain regardless of what game is suggested by other people. So kids, they don't want to play tag. They don't want to play hide and seek. They don't want to play this. They don't want to play any of it, right? <laughs> and so that's what he's referring to here. And he's making a, 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 an interesting point, right? To realize that, that people encountered the, the joy that, uh, of the gospel that Christ is calling people to, and they, they didn't love it, and they encountered the, the somberness, right, of John's preaching, and they didn't love that either. And so those were all invitations to the kingdom. And I think that what he is really getting at here is the resistance in our lives 
to the gospel. You know, it's not that we know so much better than Christ and so much better than, than, than the wisdom that the, the church wants to share. It's that, um, that we just, it just hits us the wrong way, right? We don't like it. It tends to conflict with our pre-existing values. And the, instead of being able to help us to, to grow and get beyond those values or to mature in those areas. And I, I think of something that G.K. Chesterton, the great English poet and writer, uh, said. Hopefully you've, you've read something by G.K. Chesterton or heard of him before. He said, the, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting, is in lacking. The Christian ideal has been found difficult and left untried. The Christian ideal has been found difficult and left untried. You know, I'll be very honest with you. Um, one of the things that, you, you know, I realize as a priest working with people, and this is going to come across maybe challenging, is, is to understand that, that I, realizing people sometimes how little progress they've made, you know, in their life over, over the years, in their, in their in Christianity. And I say the same thing about myself. I have to challenge myself that I, I hope that I'm listening to God and growing. It's possible to truly live your entire life as a Catholic and leave Christianity more or less untried. You never really challenge yourself. You never actually fasted. You never actually seriously gave up that thing that was kind of you know, you were kind of struggling with morally. You really never got into it. You never got serious. And, you know, as a priest, I celebrate funerals all the time. And sometimes it's like I realize, like, man, you know, life is short. And, uh, and you, you shouldn't just keep putting off getting serious. The Christian ideal has been found difficult and left untried. And let's be honest with ourselves. Most of us will probably die spiritually mediocre people. We could probably uh, allow that to challenge us a bit. Most of us will be spiritually mediocre. You know, good enough for heaven, I hope, but it's what I tend to encounter, it's not always that great, okay? And so we, we want to allow the Lord, his words, we want to allow the example set by the saints to really challenge us to to take hold of the opportunities that are available, to grow and to, to listen to the Lord. And so today, you know, briefly, I'd like to mention some people that were not spiritually mediocre, which are our saints today. Uh, Andrew was um, born in Seoul in Korea. He was a convert to the faith, and he was the first native of Korea ordained to the priesthood. His, his father had been martyred, so, so that's quite striking. And in 1846, right, uh, Andrew was tortured and beheaded along with a seminarian working with him named Paul Chonhazong. And uh, so the priest and the seminarian were killed. And so between 1839, uh, 1867 and 1839, 103 martyrs gave their lives for the faith in Korea. And today about 11% of uh, South Korea is Catholic. We probably don't have any numbers on North Korea, but about 11% of South Korea is Catholic or about 5.8 million people. So from these two people and the others who gave their lives, you get 5.8 million Catholics. And so to realize that God can do amazing, amazing things with our little gift of self. But what if they had said, wow, this is way too difficult. I mean, we're absolutely not going to risk anything for being Catholic. Plus, I have like my TikTok, you know, kind of thing going and I can't really do this. You know, could be bad for business. If, so, you know, so, so they, they would not have this. We wouldn't we wouldn't have a, a, any Catholics in that country at all. Right. And so. You know, my prayer is to allow ourselves to be challenged by the example of the martyrs, not just to, just to think, ah, oh, they did what, such great things, but to actually ask the Lord what he wants us to do, to continue to live out the faith and the charity and the hope that we're called to show in our lives.